Hello, and thank you for watching and listening to the Wood Song Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. I'm your host, Sam Larson, and today we've got an interview with Dave McIntyre. Now, Dave is an author, a speaker, but you probably know him, if you do know him, from History's Survival Series alone. And he spent 66 days out on Vancouver Island, which was enough to give him the win on season two of Histories Alone. So we've decided to, to sit down and have a, have a little chat with Dave and hear about his adventures out on Vancouver Island, as well as some of his books, as well as what it took to uh, become a hunter-gatherer out there on the island and the survival training and instructing that he did way, way, way before his time out in British Columbia. So sit back and listen. This is a real fun one, guys. I feel like I'm my grandma trying to Skype with people from, you know, like, I can't see you. I can't see you. I can hear you. So, uh, yeah, just, like, tell tell us about your your books, like your, your fiction series, because I'm interested in that hearing more uh i write post-apocalyptic fiction uh, in the the series i have which is called the fall it's uh, three books into a six book series and uh, the basic premise is that a, a biological weapon has wiped out 90 percent of the earth's population and the 10 percent that have a natural resistance to the virus uh wake up psychotic and uh it's like a zombie story for people that can't get zombies i love the zombie apocalypse genre, but I, I really don't like zombies. I, I the, <laughs> the science of it is all wrong. You know, how can this rotting corpse, you know, stagger around and, and, and actually do anything? I just can't see how, I can't see how you would, you know, they're not that scary. And in every zombie story I've ever seen, they're like, you know, they, they turn into part of the weather. You know, it's like hot and dusty, they were staggering corpses. You know, and, and the, 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 the characters run through and they just pop everybody in the head and they walk on and it's no big deal. I wanted this, the, the zombies to be characters in the story. I wanted them to actually take part in it. And uh, I, I, kept, I, I kept thinking all the things I hated about zombie stories were turning around in my head. And how would I resolve that as an author? How, how would I tell this story? And I came up with some really good ideas and decided, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start writing a few test chapters of this scenario and see how it goes. And it just turned into the fall series. And, uh, yeah, I, my characters are, I get very high marks on my characters. People really identify with them. Because that was the other thing I hate about the whole post-apocalyptic genre. Is that the, the main character is always this, this guy. He's got all the resources and training. And he's you know coming out of a bunker somewhere. And it's all solved for him. I thought, what about a guy who's just, a normal vet come, that came back from Afghanistan couldn't find a job. And then this happens. You know, he's got some combat experience, but he's not some you know Green Beret or Navy SEAL. He, I, I I took a guy actually. He's a chaplain's assistant. Chaplain's assistant. Chaplain's wow. Ass- yes, which uh, they're force protection. They actually you no know, chaplain doesn't carry a gun, so they they give him a soldier who acts as his bodyguard. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. See, I was thinking something completely different as, like, chaplain's assistant. I was thinking, like, the guy who helps the pastor out at church who, who like, is really bad at, at picking up chicks and stuff yeah. but, but tries really hard. That's what I was imagining. But, but what not you really. described is something very, very different. Yeah, not really. There, it, it, it's a thing. It's an actual military occupation. And, uh yeah, but my main character, Nick, he had one tour in, in Afghanistan as a regular regular trooper. Then he moved into that position. And uh, I don't want to get into too much about what he did, but he's a normal person. And he wakes up in the midst of this situation where everyone else, everyone that survived, you know, the world is basically populated by corpses and people that want to kill him. And uh, long story short, there's a major twist on the zombie apoc- apocalypse. The zombies are not actually dead. And I don't want to go into the you know the spoiler on this, but um, the zombies become part of the story, and they're important to the story. And uh, you know, there's a, a few premises that I, that I, I try and bring out in the story that you know people are not disposable, and uh, if you don't rise to your personal best and you're in the face of your personal apocalypse, that you're not going to survive. And Nick and Holly, the two main characters in the story, uh, illustrate that that they both have to stretch themselves. And step up into this situation to make a difference. Yeah, where, where can we like check these books out? 
Where are they available at? They're on Kindle. Uh, you can find them. Uh, if we can put the links somewhere. But uh, if you if you uh, just do a, an Amazon search for Dave McIntyre, The Fall, you'll get all three books. And book four is on its way. Book four is in the pipeline. In the pipes. Being finished by the Dave McIntyre getting getting out. That's excellent. So have you done an audio book yet? No, I haven't. Uh, I would love to set these up as audio books, but I'm looking for somebody that wants to uh, pay me to do that rather than me to pay them. So. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I, could spend a lot, I could drop a lot of money right now and make them into audio books, but recovering that on the back end is, is the key. It is, yeah. And, and then there's that part about like an audio book. You don't want that person to to be like, super annoying in their voice you know like i've got people who the author has like a perfectly normal voice and then they get their audiobook and it's like hello today is wealthy you know it's just it's the most annoying right. it's, how do you make a living at this how are you getting paid to read right. audiobooks <laughs> anyhow that's awesome and uh yeah but it would it would cost me a lot i'm looking for somebody that says hey these are good books we need them in our lineup. So, how is the um, there? Uh, it's called the the Fall series. The Fall. The Fall. The Fall series. Excellent. I'm gonna link that up. That's gonna be in the show notes. Uh, show notes. The show notes uh, will have that. So, if you if you're looking to check out the Fall series, that is where it's at. Um, most of you guys, of course, if you know Dave, you probably know him, unless you have some weird like past life in in Brazil. Uh, where he was working at the time, uh, is you know him from the television machine. And he was on the second season of Alone on History, the season after after I was on. And uh, he's really well known, uh, you know, along with a lot of other folks that were on that season, uh, with actually being able to establish kind of a working knowledge of the landscape to where they could actually uh, procure enough food from the landscape to live for a really, really long amount of time. And at, at one point, I think Dave and a couple others had actually completely adjusted to, to living there and gotten quite comfortable and, and uh, were getting enough food, getting enough calories. Uh, you know, what, what was that experience like to, to have gone out, failed a little bit, gotten back on your feet, and then actually have enough, enough calories to, uh, to live? What was the feeling of self-sufficiency like in the woods? Yeah, it was... Uh... It is a very difficult thing to step into an alien environment like that, and I had never set foot on the Pacific coast of Canada or anywhere really on the Pacific coast. You're telling and, me. Yeah, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've had seacoast experience in, in the Atlantic, uh, both North and South Atlantic, but that was a very different environment. And to go out there, uh, my first month was like a 40-day fast. <laughs> that month, it was, seriously, you're just, I, you're not eating anywhere near the, the, the amount of calories and you're, you're eating a handful of bladder rack and a few, you know, a few limpets a day, just trying to get it uh, figured out. It was two weeks before I started catching fish. And I was thinking they're going to cancel my man card. They're going to just, you know, I'll, I'll be, you know, it's a disgrace that it took me two weeks to catch fish. But yeah, it was, I think it was day 14. I started, I caught two fish and then day 15 and 16, I, I also caught fish. And then after that, we got such a storm that I was pretty much, uh, locked out of the of the cove there's nothing i could do about it um yeah you face that starvation in that first month i remember going four days at one point without eating anything and that's when uh, i i realized i was really going down the drain and i broke that fast with the one six pound portion of my emergency pemmican and i wept when i ate it i mean i i made it up and it, to me it, it felt like a defeat like i was i was defeated i was being defeated and I had to break into my emergency rations. And I made up a, you know, a small little block of it and melted it with some bull kelp and made a stew. And I cried when it, that first mouthful. It felt so good just to have that meal. Um, yeah, getting out of that situation, it was like by around day 30, uh, I got, had a handle on where to catch fish and how to find the big limpets. And I started catching crabs. And then my situation turned around. And I started getting more and more food more consistently. And you feel much better about your possibility of staying. Um, but it was a slow turnaround. It wasn't like I, I, I did, you know, all of a sudden just shot right up. It was, it was a slow incremental increase. And you realize that you're implementing your ideas and you're getting better and better and better at living out there. But then you get to a point where you're, 
your best ideas are out. You, you're, you're working the problem. You found the resources. You found the methods and the patterns. And there, it's life isn't going to get better. It's just going to get repeatable. Yeah. I you think know? That's, it, that's such a lesson. I mean, so many folks uh, need to know that, you know, whether you're doing it on the show alone or you're going to the woods to do this to, to try to live um, off the land, it takes a long time to learn a piece of land, specifically, you know, especially if it's, uh, if it's foreign to you, like the Pacific North was, Northwest was to you and I. Uh, like, it takes a long time. And I think so many folks get really intimidated with it at first and then just, like, drop out. You know, they quit. So that's, that's yeah. the lesson on alone. Like, you get, you get to grind a little bit. Like, you got to get pretty uncomfortable <laughs> and before, oh, yeah. before things get better, right? Yeah, I mean, it, the bush is very intimidating when you walk into it. I mean, I don't care what wilderness area you're walking into. When you know in your heart that you, you don't have fire, shelter, water, or food right now, it's intimidating. And to look at it and to think, you know, that the problem, I think, is, is you project that hard work. I mean, the first 72 hours of a survival ordeal, that's the work. Yeah. That's the backbreaking work of getting all that infrastructure up and running. And it's not going to be that intense the entire time. After you get things, some of your problems solved, they're solved. And you can relax. Once you get that shelter up, you can relax in there. Once you get a, a fire system going, it's going to be there. Your water su su supply is secure. You know, those things don't have to be refound again and again. They're, they're going to be there. But then you just get to concentrate on food. And it is, it is scary. But it, it, for me, it got better. The longer I was out there, the better it was, I, I was getting at procuring food and, and coming home. I got to the point where I was not willing to fast anymore. You know, if I didn't, at the end there, if I didn't have a full meal going home, I was angry. I was just really upset. It was like, oh, man, this is not cool. It was not acceptable to not have a meal when I went back to my shelter. Were you, do you have enough fat on you, like, going in to, to make it longer? How much, like, what were you down to towards the end? Did you have any fat left? My weight loss, uh, I, I remember when they weighed me, I think it was day 24 that they weighed me for the first time, and I had lost 25 pounds. And yeah. I was I in, <laughs> in, in, at 195. I, I remember, I, I think I was 195 or thereabouts, and then I was down to 170 by day 24, and then I lost another 10 pounds after that until I leveled off at like 160. And then my last, I think my last two weigh-ins, I was actually regaining weight because I was hitting the food sources there, and I was, you know, your body uses less energy, but I was rebounding. My weight was on the way up when they, they pulled me out. But, yeah, I, I'd lost a total of 35 pounds at my maximum weight loss. And That's was re awesome. Regaining yeah. that when they pulled me out. So you basically, you got down to a healthy weight, essentially. And no, then, I was not healthy, no. That, so that, that was no, a little I'm low for you? Weight. My happy weight right now, if I'm like in really good shape and, and you know, not bulked up, but if I'm in good shape, I weigh about 185. So I went out about 10 pounds heavier than my happy weight. Um, yeah, the, the lowest I've ever – I remember I got down to I – was, I was lifting for a year. I got down to 172, and people said, no, nah, you, you look too thin. And I put on another you know, couple pounds of muscle from that, and that I looked really good. And I haven't maintained that, obviously, but um, – I went out as heavy as I could get it myself, but those those body reserves were gone by that first weigh-in, easily by the first month. There's no way that I just went out fat and just lived off that body fat until they came and got me, especially because my weight bottomed out then came back up. So I had turned the corner on my situation. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. So had it had it become more of a, a psychological struggle at all? What was what was the psychological bell curve like for you personally? Uh. In the beginning, it was I was really enthusiastic to be there, and it felt really good. You know, every time I go to the bush to, to do a solo, it's because I want to recharge my batteries. And I wondered how long it would take before the, being alone was the thing that was detrimental. Um, right be, in, in the middle there, I would say before uh, before I started eating well was the lowest time. But after that first month, once I started catching those crabs, and they, they got my turning point right on the show where that – they, they showed that big crab catch. That was such a mental boost for me that I thought, you know what, I don't have to leave. Unless I get injured, I don't have to leave. I'm getting enough food. And uh, just repeat the same thing day after day after day. Um, towards the end, when it came up towards Thanksgiving, I was really 
I'd lay, lay in bed at night thinking about that Thanksgiving meal with my family. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were coming up on Thanksgiving, and I realized, okay, I'm not going to be home for Thanksgiving. I'm going to be stuck right here. <laughs> After about day 45, it was no longer fun. It was just doable. You know, I was enjoying myself up to about then. There would be days to be super hard. I didn't have anything to eat like the whole day before, and I'd just find the most beautiful thing in my landscape and shoot B-roll. Mm -hmm. to lift my spirits to say okay yeah this sucks today absolutely sucks this is a horrible day but it's sunny and look at those waves crashing on that rock isn't that beautiful and I turn the camera there turn it on frame the shot correctly shoot something beautiful and start thinking okay yeah, this sucks but I'm on a major TV show yeah and <laughs> I'm on Vancouver yeah. Island and I'm not paying to, to come here and do this you know I'm getting paid to do this so it's like, yeah, today sucks, but you also have the coolest job you've ever dreamed of, and that's cool, you know? Yeah, I mean, so so many lessons there, too. It's like, uh, you know, even in doing something, there's there's always going to be something really bad uh, that you have to deal with, you know? No matter how good your job is, there's always going to be something. For you, it was, hey, you know, you have to catch all your own food, and you, you don't get cheeseburgers. But uh, and that, w that was the exact same thing for me as just being thankful for, for one little thing, you know, finding something to be thankful for can really really give you a huge boost oh i'll tell you something psychologically that changed for me is tell I, me I was, dave tell me you know they had that, that, that morning check-in right we're supposed to set the camera up stand there like a like a zombie for you know 20 seconds and tell us, you know, <laughs> i've never heard it described 30, 30 <laughs> cold, you know, starving and then then yeah. You know, I would say, hey, today I'm planning on doing this, that, the other thing, and I'd, I'd list out my goals for the day. And in the evening, I'd set up the camera again in my shelter and say, okay, I didn't get this done, didn't get that done. Didn't... You know, the day never went as planned, ever. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided to stop. I mean, the, the, the gun to my head was in my own hand. There wasn't production there saying, okay, you have to do this, you have to do that, get this on film, you know, accomplish these things. You know, I was being... I don't know, maybe prideful in saying, yeah, I'm going to do all these things. So I just came down to a very simple motto, make tomorrow an easier day. That's all I'm going to do with today is make tomorrow an easier day. So whatever I do today has to be designed to make tomorrow easier. And at the end of the day, I would recite all the things that I did to make tomorrow an easier day. And someday there was a good list and some days it was kind of sparse. But hey, even if it was raining and then sleep pouring down and I had to stay in the shelter and saw wood, I'd say, hey, I've got a two-week supply of woodcut over there. You know, make tomorrow an easier day. Oh, I found a new fishing spot. I'm going to go back there tomorrow and I'm going to fish. You know, or I've got a full meal today. That's what I did today to make tomorrow an easier day. But just make tomorrow, just keep the goals simple. And that way it always felt like every day was a victory. I'd come back and I'd recite the positive things that I had done rather than the things I didn't accomplish. And that was huge for my mental outlook. Awesome. Make tomorrow an easier day. That's a good one. That That's good. Mine was always like, do one thing a day. Like, accomplish one thing every day. Because everyone can do one thing most days. It's, it's when you start to say, okay, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And you only get one thing, and then you get halfway done with the second thing. And then you feel bad because you didn't get all these things done. Whereas, right. you can just chill out and drink tea and do one thing. You know, and have that accomplishment and feel pretty darn good. Um, wow, yeah, that's great. That's absolutely great. So we're talking, you know, subsistence lifestyle. Um, it's it's an area you're not familiar with. It's Pacific Northwest. What what is your diet there, and how does that differ from your neck of the woods there in Michigan or where you lived prior to that in in Pennsylvania? What's like what's the difference between those two areas and your Hunter gatherer-ness in, in both well, those places. Well, when I came around, it was all seafood. I, mean, I, I ate very little other than Rucus du Mar, you know, seafood. It was great. Um, I love seafood, and that was very nice. Uh, in, in central Brazil, we had a lot, the jungle has a lot of food. There's a lot of plants to eat there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, small animals, a lot of pickup food, lizards, uh, things like that. Food is not hard to find in the jungle if you know the seasons and, and things, what's coming in, what's going out, and uh, what you can and can't eat safely. There's a lot of stuff to eat in the jungle. And that's the thing there. There was just nothing to eat in my forest. I had, when I arrived, there was still salal berries on the bushes. 
And I, I started picking them, and they would fall off. I'd, as I pulled them, they they just break apart my fingers. So I ended up just bending the trees down and just strip, stripping them off, like eating them like a bear. <laughs> That's it, man. I should go back a little bit, actually, because I, I mentioned where you'd live in, in the U.S. You had been a, a missionary prior to this as well, down in Brazil. Um, yeah. And, and part of what you did through that was teaching survival skills to, you know, missionaries and, and locals and stuff of that nature. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, you were in the the jungles and high desert and, and things like that. Tell us about Brazil. Brazil, yeah, Brazil is, uh, people think of it, it's all like the Amazon, but it has a very varied landscape, just like the U.S. Uh, I was never up in the Amazon jungle. I was in the uh, the Mata Atlantica, which is the called the Atlantic Bush, uh, in the state of Minas Gerais, which is an inland state about, I live about five hours due north of Rio de Janeiro. And you start on the coastline, it's all jungle, and then as you get higher and higher in the elevation, it turns into uh, like a scrub brush land called Cerrado. And we would live in the transition zone between those two. So in my training area, if I hiked downhill in the rainy season, I was in rainforest. And in dry season, if I hiked uphill, I was in desert and parking the car in the exact same spot. And then above that, we had mountains that went up to 6,000 feet, which actually get ice on them on the top in the wintertime. It doesn't snow, but the that does get below freezing. And uh, it, it, for me, it was an awesome training area. So I got to practice a very wide range of skills, very different from where I grew up in Pennsylvania, you know, eastern woodlands, Appalachian forest. I had jungle, desert, and mountain right there, and we ran training classes in all of those areas. So it was, uh, it was fantastic. I had a, a wilderness ministry for about 15 years where I worked with young people. Uh, from the various churches that I worked with. And then uh, in 2008, we started the Bushmaster Survival School and opened that up to paying customers. So we had people from every branch of the Brazilian military and different police forces. Uh, I had a TV producer take the, the course, an archaeologist, uh, a guy who was an actor in TV commercials, and just you, you meet amazing people doing that. And uh, it was fantastic. And these were all guided jungle trips. We did survival training in the jungle. Uh, nothing in campgrounds and that sort of thing. Do you hope to go back and to like work as an instructor at any point, and you know whether in Michigan or Brazil or anything like that? Is that I, is that like a glory days dream of yours at all? Uh, it was it was great having access to that kind of uh, that kind of wilderness so close uh, where I lived in Brazil. I don't ever see myself going back full time to Brazil. I would love to go down and teach again if I, I could set up you know courses or things. Uh, but to go back to live, uh, that's not going to happen. I've sold my house down there and everything, and uh, I miss the, – the, the land there is absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. The biodiversity is amazing. I remember walking in the Cerrado one day, and I was tired, and I sat down on a rock and just kind of had my head down because I was just you know tired, hot and tired. And I looked down, and in a one-square-foot patch on the ground, I counted, counted 17 different native plants in a size you – know, in, a, in a patch no bigger than the screen of my computer here. Wow. 17 – plants growing, occupying exactly the same ecological niche. It's just, you know, what other place has things like that? It was every time I go out, I'd see something different and new. That's awesome, man. I, man, I, I would love to go to the, that area someday, any, any place tropical. I always end up getting stuck in some kind of cold, miserable place, which I love too. But, uh, you know, rain, uh, crummy stuff. That is, that's great. Um, and you're a grandpa too, so that probably keeps you grounded to some extent you don't want to leave the grandkids too much yeah i do have two little grandbabies now a, a nine month old and a three month old does that make you old or were you old prior to having grandkids i am not old i have not been <laughs> I'm 52 that's not old that isn't old you're younger than my parents well that's comforting <laughs> you can officially say Dave Mack is is certainly not old. He's younger than my parents. That's that's the that's the the deal there. Um, so how how'd you get started in all this? Obviously, you don't just fly down to Brazil, start a a wilderness survival uh, school, and and get rolling like that. How'd you get started in uh, in uh, you know spending time in the woods and, and survival skills and things like that? And what brought you to Brazil? There's never been a time in my life I wasn't in. I grew up. Uh, on the edge of the suburbs, and we had this huge forest out out back, and you know, fallow farm fields, and a railroad right away, and a creek runs through it. And, you know, it was it was a great place to be a kid. 
and I grew up out there hunting, fishing, trapping, building forts in the woods and crazy about American Indians and doing all that. And as we got older, my brother and I, uh, when I was about 15, we started going out by ourselves on the Appalachian Mountains. My parents had a house up in the mountains and we just tell my folks, hey, dro drop us off on the mountain and pick us up on Sunday. So they drop us off on Friday. We'd go out, do our thing, and uh, they, you know, we'd meet them somewhere, and they'd pick us up on Sunday on the way home. And we'd spend every weekend out there on the mountains, uh, prim you know, primitive camp. We, we went with very minimal gear, you know, and uh, in the beginning, we made every mistake we could and, uh, you know, got rained on and blisters and, you know, poison, you know, everything you can imagine, We every problem. And the wilderness survival became, for me, a way to make all that easier, and it became an intriguing problem for me. Uh, just to go out in the woods and, and solve that and become really good at just operating in the bush. And then I, uh, see, 1989, I got married to a girl who was a missionary kid in Brazil. And we went down for two years from 90 to 92 to teach missionary kids. And uh, I taught in English for two years in Brazil and really fell in love with the place. And then we came home with our first daughter. Erin was born there. And I started teaching here in the States. I remember one of my students says, you know, Mr. Mack, you love Brazil. You talk about Brazil so much. Why don't you just go back? And I, maybe he was trying to get rid of me. I don't know. But um, we did. In 94, we went down for the summer. My wife was a teacher as well. So we went down over summer break and spent a few months in Brazil. And I just I just felt at home there. And I felt that I could make more of a difference in life uh, going back as, as a church planning missionary than teaching American history in the U.S. So... That took a career change. We had to. I had to become an ordained Baptist pastor. I did a two-year internship uh, at a church in Pennsylvania, raised support for two years, and then 1999 we arrived back in Brazil with our second daughter. Wow. Yeah. So you weren't messing around then. That's a lot of stuff to pack into that amount of time. Um. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, I had a year of language study and, a, and another one-year internship just before I was qualified to be cut loose on my own. So it's a. It's a. It's not an easy thing to be qualified to be a foreign missionary. You couldn't just, like, print out a certificate on the Internet. Oh, no. No, it took me 10 years, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Excellent. That's sweet, man. Um, so, as we're talking about, like, progression and things, what made you want to take on the, like, the, the challenge of doing a lot? We talk about it as a challenge, so to speak, which it is. It's more of like a like a rite of passion, a, a rite of passage right. type scenario. What so what made you want to like have that rite of passage experience in your life? It's kind of crazy. I mean, I had oh man, at the end uh, end of my career in Brazil, uh, my wife announced we were getting a divorce, and there's a lot. There's a lot <laughs> I love of how you say that. <laughs> it's not funny, it's but awful. but okay. it's. <laughs> That's the thing that brought me home from Brazil, okay? And there's a lot to that story. No way we're going to go into all the details here. Right, right. Um, but a lot of really horrible things that happened to us in Brazil, things that, you know, I don't want to put out on TV, but, you know, I wasn't cheating on my wife or anything like that. It was just really, really heart heartbreaking stuff that happened. And uh, so I, I find myself in living here in Michigan. I'm inspecting foreclosed homes for about a year and a half in my one bedroom apartment, you know, and, and life is not turning out the way I, I had expected it to. And uh, then I lost my job. The, the company lost the contract for Michigan and closed down and we lost Michigan and 17 other states. So I was out of a job. And this is when I was, uh, I was finishing my books, my, my book series. I thought, you know what, life is not going the way I want it to. I have some money saved up. I'm going to finish these books and then I don't know what I'm going to do. So I'll find a, a day job, I guess. So I just started writing and finishing those stories and then I got a, actually got a Facebook message from alone they you know Natalie at, at left field she's uh, you look she like, said do you look a great a great candidate for our show could you apply and I had never heard of it so I checked out the uh, the web you know the link they gave me and I thought okay anywhere in the world total wilderness totally alone self-documented up to a year five hundred thousand dollar cash prize I'm like yeah I could do that <laughs> yeah. Yep, 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 yep. It's not That's a hard like, sell. <laughs> no, it was, it was an easy sell once I saw that. And I thought, you know, seriously, I had done a screen test for the Discovery Channel uh, down in their version of Dual Survival in Brazil. And, uh, and on that one, it came down to me and another guy. And they went with the other guy. There was two positions, and they had they already filled the one. And 
I was right there and it didn't happen. And I thought, you know what? I know how this TV thing works. It's like a Hail Mary pass at life. I'll go ahead and apply for this thing. Yeah. And I went through the casting process. Um, you know, wound up at boot camp and had a great time there. And a few weeks later, I'm on Vancouver Island. Yeah. It's a, it's a trip, man. I like that's, that's exactly how I felt about mine is I was also contacted by the same person. Uh, <laughs> and we, uh, just, just kind of, you fill out the application. You're like, yeah, I know how this works. You, you know, you apply, you don't hear back, you get a generic email that says, "Sorry, we're we're booked," or else you just it's see the show back. air, right? <laughs> or else you just turn on the TV one day and the show you were supposed to be on is airing. Um, but yeah, like, and and for you, because I know what my experience was like going through the casting process, like getting to to the boot camp. And for those who don't know. Uh, they fly you to New York. I don't, I don't know where, where you guys were at. Um, we were at like this Holiday Inn Express or something like that in upstate New York. And uh, for us, it was like 10 guys. No, it was more than that. It was like double that. So like 18 to 20 guys, uh, no, no females around. And it was just like puffed out chests, you know, guys trying to convince each other that they're like the, the toughest of the tough. And I love all the guys, of course, that that got on the show and it was one of the most entertaining weeks I think I think that I've personally ever had but like what was what was season two's experience with that I've never really heard the the deets on that the boot camp for for us I mean I have nothing had nothing to compare it to we were at a very nice hotel in uh Suffern New York and uh it was it was a nice place and there was about must be nice Dave it was it was and they had really good meals you know and uh there was women in the group, you know, there was, uh, Mary Kate was there and Nicole, of course, and a few other, and Tracy and a few others. And, uh, it, it was, it was fun. I mean, you could, you could always tell where our group was by hearing them laughing somewhere. Yeah. And there's all these people walking around in like normal society. And there's like Jose walking around, he's wearing his knife, you know, it, <laughs> it, it, totally. I mean, we were definitely a spectacle there. Mm hmm. You know how it is. You got the the camera aptitude training and psychological profiles, and it's like half the day is just boring test paperwork, and then they're sticking needles in you. You're doing a physical, turn your head and cough kind of thing. Yep. And uh, <laughs> then you play the foot. No <laughs> exaggeration. You do turn yeah. your head and cough. That is part of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, we got to go out in the woods and play, and that was a blast. Yes. That was very very fun. Very well done. The uh, it gave me confidence in the show because the quality of the survival consultants that were there doing it. Yep. You got their real. You got you know was, you know Kiernan was there and uh, Dan Westall for us, and you really got the impression these guys know their stuff and you're not fooling anybody. Yep. The, I mean, yeah, the consultants on there are first class. They were they were excellent. They were you know no BS straight up yeah. you know straight away very clear and. I, I enjoyed it so much, and I, probably for the same reasons that you did. It was just they would sit you down and give you a very straightforward instruction. You know, do X, Y, Z. And it's, we could probably mention this stuff because it has been on television. So they, show, they show some of it, yeah. Yeah. The so one thing, yeah. I was the only one in our group that made friction fire in the time allotted. Okay? They got us all back together, and they're like, Well done. Did, you, who, did anyone succeed? I'm like, Yes, I did. And they didn't show it on the, the Making the Cut episode. Oh, my goodness. I was like, because they, they couldn't, I guess, because I was like the winner. Anyway. <laughs> I, I'm the only one that did that. Sounds like a conspiracy theory to me, Dave. It is. You know, they couldn't show me slaying it during my audition. They could cause... show me slaying my, my tea. Yeah, they could show me water. Yeah, that's Dave in the bush, right. Very few moments are that special. For those of you who don't know, Dave spilled his pot of boiling water one time. Uh, something that I think, uh, I mean, if I, I see every time I've done that in my life, I'm probably up to like 20 or 25 times. Uh, and it happens. Beautiful framing on that, by the way. Totally yes. caught. Filmed, filmed very well and uh, just replayed. So picture, but for you guys at home watching this, picture... You're filming yourself, and every little mistake you make is amplified and shown, uh, you know, specifically to see, like, look at this guy. 
He made a mistake. That's going to sting. That's going to sting a little bit. Were there any mistakes that you made during your time? Well, I mean, during during your audition or uh, during your time on the island that were, like, real bad? What was your, like, worst mistake? Falling in. Falling? Yeah. I went that day I fell in. That was the stupidest thing in the world. I mean, my hands were numb. And I, I went down. You know, the rocks there are so slippery and everything. And I went down to the edge. I was planning on throwing out this this carcass on a line to, to haul crabs in. And the my hand was numb. And it, it, when I threw it out, it just a loop of the line slipped over the roll in my hand and it pulled it off and it landed on the rocks right down below me. And all I'm thinking is, I'm going to lose my line. And, I, and there's a little flat patch down there, and I stepped down onto that to reach down and pick up that line, and I slipped off that little patch, and in I went. The stupid thing, my fishing pole is right there with a hook on the end of it. I could have just lowered the hook down and pulled it up, but I didn't even cross my mind. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like calorie deprivation or whatever. It wasn't, it was the morning. I hadn't had my cup of coffee is what it was. And yeah, you just in this brain fog, and it was just the dumbest thing. And I lost the whole day over that. You know, I burned up all my hardwood, drying out my clothes, and it was like an entire day of just dealing with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's like a... It, it seems like that's not very easy to avoid to an extent. Slip Like slipping on wet rocks, you know? It seems like that's, that's a very common man mistake. You know, at least it's not something really stupid. I didn't have to put myself in that position. I didn't even consider that there was other options other than stepping down there. I just did it and fell yeah. in. It looks so dumb on camera. It's like, oh, I dropped my line in the water. Splash. I'm just going <laughs> to Oh, I remember. Yeah. Humiliating. I just filmed that. I remember speaking to you beforehand. You were, it. I, it everyone's got to admit, it's, to some extent, one of the most entertaining things about being on alone is watching the chatter on social media about yourself. Like, oh, yeah. Make, you, you're, you overnight become like a public figure that people can say bad things about who, right. who don't know you at all. What was that experience like for you? Because I remember speaking to you about that and it just being you know, just something like fun to laugh about. Like, What, what was your experience with it? You know, how, you know how it is. I mean, you can't even say that you were going, you're going to be on the show until they start marketing it. Yeah. You know, it's already said and done. It's been months done for, you know, last couple of months. And I knew that I'd won. You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden you can start talking, say, yeah, you can say that you were on the show and they're going to, it's going to be coming out. And uh, they came out with an online poll and it gave me a 5% chance of winning. Yeah. <laughs> well, based on our bios, I guess they haven't even seen us. And I thought, well, good night. You get a 10% chance just by showing up. Right. It should Seriously. be that way. Yeah. But, you know, there was all kinds of people. Uh, I remember, I remember this this one person, really acidic, you know, caustic kind of person that said, "Oh, you know, he's a Christian, therefore his his belief in his sky god is going to let him down, and he's going to look for unrealistic solutions, and he'll find out his faith is worthless and all that." And I'm sitting <laughs> reading, thinking, "Oh my goodness, this is exactly the opposite. This person is delirious, delusional. You and know, you can't I, say I, anything." The opposite had happened for me. And it was just, you know, it was such a powerfully spiritual experience to be out there and such a connection that, you know, that's that's what made it beautiful to me. And to, to see people saying such horrible, nasty things that they know nothing about you. You know, yeah. I, I, when, I was, when I was in Brazil as a missionary, the, the first uh, car I had down there was really nice. I bought a decent car by Brazilian standards. It wasn't anything, you know, spectacular. But I remember one day I pulled up at a stop, stop sign. And a little kid ran out, spit on the car, and ran away. And I thought, why did he do that? You know. And it, but you know what? I, thought, I realized right away he wasn't spitting on me as an American or as a missionary or as a Christian or as a man or anything. He was spitting on a shiny car because that's the kid that you know that's what he wanted to do. It really wasn't. He wasn't really spitting on me. He was spitting on who he thought I was. Right. Matter. You know what I mean? So when people start to criticize me like that, it's like, yeah, he's not, they're not spitting on me. They're spitting on this image they've conjured up that they think I am. It's not really me. So it didn't really affect me that much. You know. That's a good analogy, man. Yeah. That's, a, that's a stinking good social media analogy. <laughs> I'm a preacher. That's what I do. I... <laughs> you, you preach. Absolutely. 
Um, so, <laughs> sweet. Yeah, the, uh, the it, it, ah, it's just so much fun to watch. And I bet for you, it was even more enjoyable. Like, because you know you've won, right? You've won yep. months prior. So you get to watch all this and just laugh the entire time at people saying, you know, well, I think Dave's inferior because X, Y, Z. And uh, you would say, I, I think you make some very valid points. <laughs> there was a whole Reddit thread of Dave McIntyre is incompetent. Really? <laughs> And I think they've deleted it since. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I'm going to look it up. If it's still out there, it will be in the show notes. <laughs> Dave yeah. McIntyre is incompetent. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. <laughs> right, because well, it's hindsight, it. right? It, you're like, yeah. I don't the way care. They edit, the way they edit the show, you know, they every every one of us has our arc, you know? And if you're out there longer, mm -hmm. then they have more of your story to tell in the in the episodes and you know, they, they kind of, I think they kind of kept me on the back burner and they didn't want people to get an idea that I was doing well out there. Oh, yeah. And, and they kept that as a suspense right up until the last episode. But there was a lot of things that I did out there that were not shown. And, you know, that's true of all of us. So, but there was a lot of victories that weren't shown. On the topic of you winning in an unexpected uh, manner, so to speak, I do want to come out and say that I did a very crappily put together interview with Mary Kate about week three or four of the show. The, it was like two weeks after she had uh, cut her hand off with an ax. And uh, I call in the interview. We'll link it up. I'll put it in the show notes. It'll suck to watch the whole thing because I re recorded it so poorly. I call Dave Mack as, well, not the winner, but as the guy to watch. So it's uh, did you know that? Yeah, I think I, I think I did remember you mentioning that in that interview. Yeah. So it's out there. The good thing yeah, about social out, media. Out. Bam. Bam, son. I never thought I was out there. I never thought I was going to win it. I mean, it wasn't like, uh, you, you know, the skill level of the people that are out there as well. You know, the other people that are, that are there. And there's some incredibly skilled people on, on the cast of season two. And the, the, there's so many variables. You know, like Jose flipping his kayak. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, the man built a kayak with a knife. <laughs> this is, you know what I'm saying? This is a skilled individual. And for him to go out that way, that's, you know, that's very unpredictable. Right. You know, I could, have, I could have easily broken something when I fell, the numerous times I fell, and just been gone. You know, in, in season four, who was it? One of the Bosdells, you know, fell and hurt his back. Yeah, dude. Yep. You know, that's hard. That, and, and those are very skilled men. You know, very skilled, tough as nails, and go out slipping, you know, how many, that could have been any of us. Absolutely. And I remember being ex exceptionally careful not to slip, not to fall, not to take those kind of chances, because that's the easiest way to get off the show, is to just get some relatively minor injury. Did you have that feeling of, like, everyone out there is doing better than I am right now? When we got to day, when we got to day 56, that was the last day that Alan was out there. And I was remember commenting on that, uh, you know, on camera. And they, don't, they didn't use my comments, but I remember thinking, "There's got to be somebody out there that's sleeping on a bearskin rug and eating eating dried salmon, and you know, <laughs> and the rest." I knew there was there was someone out there that was doing really, really good at that point. And looking back on it now, there was four of us out there. There was there was me, Larry, Nicole, and, and Jose, and all of us were doing relatively good at that point. You know, there was you know, Jose was still eating, and Nicole was still eating. You know, she didn't go home because she was starving. You know, she says her son called her home, and that yeah, I believe that that's what happened. You know, with her, but she was not starving, and neither was uh, Jose. And you know, Larry at that point was still eating, and you know, it was a struggle for all of us. But I really did think there was somebody out there that was just really doing well and was going to be out there for a long time. I had it in my mind I'd be out there till Christmas. But that was wow. my expectation. That I was going to be there until the end of December. That'd be wicked. And in, in the end, you were there. Just past Thanksgiving, right? No, they pulled me out the day before Thanksgiving. The day before Thanksgiving, okay. And I still had two and one six pounds of my pemmican left. So and I, when I would eat my pemmican, I would eat a one six pound portion. So I had thirteen of those meals left. Yeah. See, that's that's the difference between the the first and second season, and you can look at it one way, which is like the kind of the the weirdo internet troll way of like season two was easier or you could look at it the realistic way and and see like 
season two was put in a better situation to actually demonstrate some really cool things and live a life in the wilderness. But season two started about a month prior to uh, to when season one started. I, I think about a month because I I you know stayed like ten ish whatever days less than you, and I left in mid December. Um, right. So there was like a, a difference in, in the days, and I think having a show that was more you know closer to the warmer time of the year for you guys it it allowed us to see more of like what skills can be demonstrated what can be procured from the environment so i i personally like love that about season two that you guys had the opportunity to to show a lot of those things we had nicer weather than you guys i remember uh there was you know some stretches there where it was it was sunny you know and it wasn't warm but it was it would be sunny and, and relatively dry you wouldn't get Counter with rain every day, but when it's bad, it's bad. And when you're been starving for 66 days, I don't care what time of year it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Living on that calorie deficit for that long, it takes a toll on you. My legs were like sticks. You could see the bones in my chest. Yeah. I'd never seen them in my life, you know. And when I got out, I the first time I took that shower, I took that you know all those clothes off, and I'm standing there looking at myself in the mirror. I'm thinking, man, dude, what did you do to yourself? <laughs> My neck was thin. You could see the bones in my chest and my ribs and everything. And yeah. it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. I don't care what time of year it is. That that level of starvation is hard. I, we asked one of the people in the Quatino First Nation after coming out, like, so what? What did you guys do during the winter time when it was hard to survive? And they said, "Are you kidding me? We stayed inside and ate dried salmon. Like we stayed inside and ate smoked <laughs> salmon all winter long. We're not going out in the cold rainy times. We're not stupid, you know." <laughs> Yeah, when their when their young people did their, you know, that's the thing is the Quatsino would put their young people out on that that land alone to live off the land as a rite of passage. Mm-hmm. They would use that to you know to teach that young person. Oh, you want to be a young rebel? This is what it's like to live on your own. Uh-huh. And you you want to you know if you're going to be disrespectful to, to your culture, this is you know you're going to learn what what we have by going out away from us and then come back. Okay, and then they would use what we did as a rite of passage. But they wouldn't do it in the in the winter, you know. They they'd send them out there, you know, when it, when they knew they weren't going to get killed. Yeah. By the way, awesome video on that that was put out during season one of a of a tribal elder, kind of talking about these uh, the First Nations people and their their rite of passage. That'll be in the show notes as well. Uh, we'll get that in there because it's an awesome experience, well, right? You're talking about internet trolls and the the, the armchair commandos. People would say all the time. Well, it's easy to live up there. The native people lived there, you know, effortlessly, and they had all this, you know, yeah, the, the food was there. They lived in community, and they respected the hardship of the solo experience in their environment. Right. You know, they valued that as a, a test of endurance. Right. To be in that land by yourself, living off that land. Yeah, I think the guy uh, from the nation in that, in that video says three months was, like, really impressive. For a native dude to go out and live on his own in the summertime and then come back, like if they lasted three months, they were a gladiator. Right. You know? So the fact, I mean, and we get modern tools, ten of them, so that's yeah. that helps us out a little bit. But it, it's cool to see just that the the fact that there is this challenge and this amount of of human resilience that still exists in people today you know the same stuff that they had inside of them we have inside of us and it's it's awesome to watch unfold they didn't have to film it and they didn't have to film it exactly they didn't have to film it do you think they did film it though even though they didn't have to i i don't think so okay. it's kind of hard to witchcraft a video camera yeah they, they're talented folks though yeah amazing <laughs> So we are uh, we're coming to a, a a bit of a close here. I don't want to leave though without um, talking about what Dave's doing now. Dave, what are you what are you doing now? I assume you're not still uh, looking at foreclosed homes as much. Ones, ones that I bought, I have I have a bunch of guns, probably about fifteen twenty guns. But I bought a, a, a Smith Wesson four forty two small J frame revolver, which uh, is a Mill thirty eight special. I've always wanted one of them. I bought a CZ 75 nine millimeter classic nine millimeter high capacity auto. Uh, it's more of a range gun because I just enjoy shooting it. I bought a new shotgun because I needed one. I'm trying to think what else. 
that's that's the three guns I bought. I bought a Jeep. I didn't. I'm not a. I'm not a very complicated person. <laughs> I've moved too many times to amass all kinds of stuff, you know. So I, I don't. I don't do that. What kind of Jeep did you buy? Uh, Cherokee Laredo, nineteen or two thousand and nine. Classy, I don't, not, not classy man. Classy. I am, not, I am not a new car guy. Why would you? Safe and depreciation. You don't buy. Yeah, you don't buy a new car. That's I don't know. That's my opinion. No, I like my Jeep. It's been working great. Slick. But other than that, no, I haven't really bought a whole lot of stuff. I, I never buy knives. I know that's horrible, but people send me knives for testing and evaluation and stuff, and I, I never, you know, I, I, I never, I have better knives than I ever dreamed possible. Nice. You know, and uh, very grateful for some, you know, when I was a missionary, someone uh, gave me a skookum bush tool. A, fr- a friend. He ordered one, one of those from Rod Garcia, and that was my bushcraft knife for a long time. Scoop and I didn't even know he had ordered it. You know, it's a two-year waiting list for him. And uh, yeah. I get this email message, hey, your knife is ready. Where do you want it shipped? And I'm like, what knife? Oh, didn't you know someone two years ago bought you a Skookum Bush Tool and put it on, put you on my list? That's awesome. Skookum yeah. Bush Tool. Now, people are very generous and good, and I try and return that favor. Excellent. Excellent. That's huge. Dave, let's end with this. What's your advice to someone who wants to take on a challenge, maybe alone, maybe it's solo wilderness living in an independent setting, someone who wants to take on a similar challenge to that? What's your advice to them? You mean like be on a TV show or just head off and do that? Just just the experience, not necessarily with the TV show. I would say, number one, know your, know your limitations and have a backup plan. Do, do not do this. Without a without an exit strategy, you know, the, uh, just be, you you can be alone. You know, that's one of the things that people. If you want to divorce your ego from it, you know, if you want to practice winter skills, you can do that right outside. You don't have to go five miles into the wilderness and prove something. You know, if you're trying to prove something, I would say there's probably a better way to do it. Uh, divorce your ego from the whole thing. You know, if you if you want me to prove I'm a man, I'm going to pee standing up. That's all I'm going to do for you. you know? <laughs> I am a man. Okay, you accept me or not? You know that people do the wilderness activities or they do a challenge like that really to be seen as or to be known for, and I think that's a big mistake uh, because your ego will get you into trouble. If you're if you're defending your ego, you get in a lot more fights than just if you're defending your life. You know, right. and uh, that's. People carry that over into the wilderness where they go out there trying to prove that they're better than other people or more manly than other people. And I think it, you know, the wilderness is the wilderness because it has already won. And people don't get that. You know, I'm in, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan right now. It used to be the howling wilderness. It's not anymore because mankind beat it and we civilized this spot. So you go someplace like the UP, it's not so easy to beat, right? And it's still the wilderness. So you go to Vancouver Island, any place that's still wilderness today beat the crap out of us and kick this out. And that's why it's wilderness. It's already won. You're not going to beat it. So people think, you know, you're more manly if you do these. Uh, no, 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 no. You know, it, the, the, the bush teaches you humility. And if you haven't had your head handed to you yet, you haven't gone in deep enough or stayed long enough. And that's the lesson that the bush teaches is humility. That it can take you and crumple you up and spit you out. And that's the awesome quote you use at the end of your podcast. <laughs> awesome, Dave. <Okay. laughs> so we want to say in closing here, all the stuff, Dave's contact info, where to get his books, if you want him to speak at your, your stuff, how to contact him, all that's going to be in the show notes. Check it out. Dave McIntyre, thanks for talking, man. Well, thanks for having me on. Good to talk to you again. Absolutely, dude. Have a good one. Yep. So that's it for today's episode. Once again, thank you so much for watching or listening to this podcast, the Woodsong Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. We want to remind you, if you would, please uh, subscribe to whatever venue you're watching this on. So YouTube, Stitcher, uh, iTunes. And also, if you feel so inclined, you want to interact with us about this podcast a little bit, we are available. It's Sam Larson Dash Woodsong on Facebook. It is Sam Explores on Twitter and Sam Explores on 
Instagram. Once again, thanks for your time, guys, and have an excellent day.